So I really started thinking about like, well, what is the future of like jobs? How many AIs can I employ at my company? As soon as we get the first tiny box up, I'm going to stand up a 65B llama in the Discord. Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, here's the tiny box. He's just like, he's chilling with us. Hello, friends. Welcome to AI Flux. So today, Meta released Code Llama, and it's developed not to make it so we can actually engineer llamas to code, but moreover, so Meta can actually replace expensive software engineers and interns with machines and get more output per engineer they still feel is actually worth paying in dollars as a, a fleshy human bag of water and neurons. So why is this good? Why is it different than other coding models? What do I use as a remote sensing data engineer? Let's get into it. So what I really like about Meta is they really know how to showcase models to a wide audience and show the real technical core of why you should use their model. For instance, here they have an example where uh, an engineer is, is using this to create a bash script. This is a really common thing that people use code interpreter on chat GPT-4 to do. And so it's interesting. Right here they say in bash, how do I list all text files in the current directory, not including subdirectories with a certain kind of time frame for this. And what's cool is this actually actually is a mixture of just providing the raw results. So a lot of times with code interpreter, it'll just give you the script. It'll say, here's how you should maybe do that. And what I like about this is there's a strong learning context. So it's saying uh, you can use find command and bash to list all the files, and then it shows you how to use it. And it gives you a breakdown similar to what ChatGPT4 does. And I've messed around with this a bit. And I actually think it's a little bit better at very specific things. And you can tell that Facebook maybe has picked a few really specific problems they've had maybe in training interns or doing really simple things that this model is actually just incredible at getting completely right. So the core takeaways, Code Llama is a state-of-the-art LLM capable of generating code and natural language about code. I think the natural language about code is much more of a focus here. And of course you can prompt this with natural language. That's the whole idea of an LLM. It's free for both research and commercial use. The other thing is you can download the model right now. There's a link right here to do so. And that'll be in the description below. It uses Python. It is specialized for Python, which is kind of interesting, um, especially since Python is really what all of the tooling for a lot of the LLM stuff is. There are some other platforms, but really Python is the root of all infrastructure for this. And they say in our own benchmark testing, which this is a, a huge caveat because benchmarking these models is actually quite a highly debated topic these days. They say that Code Llama outperforms state-of-the-art publicly available LLMs on code tasks. So do they mean GPT-4 with this? We don't really know. They'd probably like to make that claim. I would argue that the claim is likely against GPT-3.5 doing coding tasks. They make an introduction here. Uh, they're very big on their latest evolution of the community license that Llama 2 uses which some would argue is not really open source, but still allows people to use this for commercial use. And they give us some insight into how Code Llama actually works. So they say here, Code Llama is a code specialized version of Llama 2 that was created by further training Llama 2 on its code specific data sets. So basically uh, using those initial data sets and then running through its own output to improve the specificity of capability in this model with coding. They say sampling more data from that same data set for longer was what they did. Essentially, Code Llama features enhanced coding capabilities built on top of Llama 2. It can generate code, natural language about code, like they said, and you can prompt it more organically than you can GPT-4 by saying things like, write me a function that outputs the Fibonacci sequence, which you've really been able to do for a while. They mostly focus on Python, but they also claim this has C++, Java, PHP, TypeScript, C Sharp, and Bash. I would argue that the most value these tools create right now is with TypeScript, Python, and Bash, just as pure productivity gains. Curiously, a lot of the co-pilot coding models really only focus on a few things. They're not trying to do everything. They're releasing three different sizes. So for now, you can get 7B, 13B, and 34B parameter models. Um, each is trained with 500 billion tokens of code and code-related data. The code-related data, I would argue, is probably from pull requests and just Git data that Facebook has about their developers. Part of the reason Google has been so good with their coding model so far is because they have the most developers to generate the most data from and they don't even have to go and find it. This is also why Microsoft has been sort of making search on GitHub harder to do without a logged in account and actually limits it if you don't have a pro account because they're starting to realize that what everyone wants to do is just scrape all of the commits, all of the progressive you know, steps people have made to develop software on GitHub so they can understand how humans do it to train machines to do it. So they say here that the three models address different serving and latency requirements. The 7B model, for example, can be served on a single GPU. The 34B model returns best results and allows for better coding assistance. The smaller 7B and 13B models are faster and more suitable for tasks that require low latency, like real-time code completion. And by this, like code completion, they're talking directly about 
uh, sort of these co-pilot coding uh, assistants that everyone likes to use now, which I think, quite frankly, are not that useful. Um, to me, they're still kind of annoying, like a predictive text that just pastes blocks of code when you don't want it. Um, generally, I'll keep GPT-4 running in another window, or I have uh, a fine tune that I've personally tweaked of Wizard LM that I particularly use a lot for JavaScript. They say here that the Code Llama models provide stable generations of up to 100,000 tokens of context. All models are trained on, to on a sequence of 16,000 tokens and show improvements on inputs with up to 100,000 tokens. So why this is important is this is basically how much code it can generate, um, generally what they trained it on, and then how much code you can feed in within a single context window. The reason this is important is code doesn't necessarily scale as text linearly with tokens. And this is a really different thing than with prose or just like writing a book or you know, creating an essay or those kinds of things um, because LLMs are actually better at that. It's a language they understand more just because we've had more time and generally there's more data to train them with on these things. This limit here is probably the biggest linchpin of this whole thing because it limits uh, how much within a single context window you can send in in terms of code. So if you have a repo right now, you probably have to pick certain parts of it you wanna put in so it can give you an answer. So for instance, once these are more capable, if you wanted to debug a certain portion of the code base or you thought a bug was related to a specific portion of the code base, you're limited in that. So you're, you have to be careful with how much context you want to give the model before it gives you an answer. Some other interesting things they say are, Aside from being a prerequisite for generating longer programs, having longer input sequences unlocks exciting new use cases for a code LLM. For example, users can provide the model with more context, like, like we were just saying, from their code base to make generations more relevant. It also helps debugging, like again, like we just said, debugging scenarios on larger code bases. And what's curious here is they don't actually say, like we were just talking about, how code does not scale linearly with tokens as opposed to natural language. And the irony of that is the whole token model was sort of calibrated against natural language and not code. So that's why we see this. Now there's a lot more information here. What the last thing I wanna cover here is why they picked Python. And they say, we have further fine tuned two additional variants of Code Llama, Code Llama Python and Code Llama Instruct. Instruct I think is a bit more interesting, but here's what they are. So Code Llama Python is a language specialized version of Code Llama further fine tune on 100 billion tokens of just Python code. And it's not surprising why they did this because they say here, because Python is the most benchmarked language for code generation, and because Python and PyTorch are used ubiquitously in basically every LLM in existence today, they say we believe these models provide additional utility. And I mean, the biggest reason they did this was to just juice uh, how well they could benchmark, right? It's, I'm surprised that they actually admitted this and. I would not be surprised if many other models are doing this. We've seen a lot of models from China do this and hide the fact that they've optimized for Python. And Code Llama Instruct, which I think is the biggest breakthrough here, they say is an instruction fine tune and aligned variation of Code Llama. Instruction tuning continues the training process, but with a different objective. So not necessarily just to make code. They say the model is fed a natural language instruction and input and the expected output. This makes it better at understanding what humans expect out of their prompts and is more of kind of like an instructor or right in between of what people use a lot of ChatGPT and even Bard for and trying to do it all in one. And, I, and this approach I think is quite novel because for me, ChatGPT4 GPT4 is actually not very good at giving you concise kind of high level instructions. It's very good at specific instructions and it gets them wrong a lot of the time. Bard is the same way. Now there are some other tools like Perplexity AI that just focus on grokking um, documentation. And they think that that really leads to better kind of instruction as to how you do things, and it does. But what's cool here is you can get the instruction attribute along with the code attributes and actually have them reinforce the, the underlying model itself because the underlying model is similar to like the Linux kernel. You can always refer back to that. And I have a strong theory that eventually we will look at LLMs and how we build on top of them in very similar ways to how we look at the Linux kernel with container. But that's another video we'll get into at some point. So now, how does it work? So we have, again, Llama 2 base, and then things built on top of it, and you end up with, uh, after some pretty significant fine tuning, the resultant models they provide here. Now, they have some information here on evaluating performance. Obviously, they have mostly uh, optimized for Python, which isn't really surprising because the benchmarks that, that they mentioned are human eval and mostly basic Python programming are the two benchmarks they lean on the most. And uh, you can see here that uh, they have code llama here. GPT-4 still appears to be the gold standard in human eval. 
Code Llama, however, is still quite good. And we can hop into this at some point. Now, I will say that Code Llama Python approaches the capabilities of GPT-4. Uh, Code Llama, at least in uh, multilingual human eval, actually does quite well. And in MBPP, uh, you can tell that their optimization of Python was worthwhile because they're the top performing model at, with their 34B uh, instruct model, which is kind of interesting. Now, as they've said, you can download it right now. Another thing that was surprising in closing is they actually have a whole thing with responsible use of a coding model, which uh, I have not really seen before. It does make sense, however, because if you think about it, um, they don't want developers de developing malware, viruses, or malicious code in general. And classifying this is kind of interesting because I've found that sometimes when you try to create uh, security-focused implementations or tools with these LLMs, uh, ironically, sometimes I'll say, oh, well, well, you're trying to hide that. And the irony is that AI safety in software um, quickly can approach um, something that feels like reinforcing a government's ability to snoop. And um, you would want, look, look, one thing I would never do with this is have this write like a core security function for anything. Because um, I do see a time where the government relies on this to actually uh, encourage developers who aren't really as um, skilled as they might need to be uh, to write important security code in ways that they really shouldn't, that leaves backdoors open. So imagine a time where the government approves LLM safety, and then the LLM safety itself, once we're writing code that's too complex for all developers to understand right off the bat, um, actually programmatically is including backdoors that humans wouldn't maybe catch that are generated by AI, but are banned by AI because that's evaluation of AI safety uh, rules that are set by the government. So a curious hypothetical, but um, yeah, look in the description below for the links for this. I'm gonna be messing around with this this week, seeing if it's better than my kind of bespoke approach. And as always, I hope you learned something. Uh, if you really like our content, please like and subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.